clicking. Well, welcome to Facebook Live. I'm Highland Slobotkin. I'm the rabbi at Beit Tikva Messianic Congregation in the Seattle area. Glad you tuned in with us again. Yeah, we're so glad to be here together. Uh, we're going to have a great time discussing some of the questions that are on your hearts. I'm Rabbi Stuart Winograd, co-founder of Reach Initiative International, along with my wife, Chantal. And we're also going to share some interesting insights regarding Pesach, Passover, one of God's appointed times. And uh, I love Passover. It's, uh, it's another one of those great God-ordained festivals. And uh, for people who don't know, in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 1 and 2, we are told that... Uh, these are God's appointed festivals, God's, God's appointed times. I remember when I was a young believer as a Jewish follower of Yeshua, sometimes I would be invited into churches, Highland, to teach on the Jewish feasts, and I called it that. And then the Lord took me back to Leviticus 23 again, and he said, no, they're not the Jewish feasts. They are my appointed times first given to the Jewish people, and I welcome people from every nation under heaven to celebrate them as well, because they are my, the Lord says, my appointed times and my appointed feasts. Yeah, you know, in, in the Hebrew, it says, Mo'adei Adonai, which, which means literally the appointments of God, appointments mm -hmm. of the Lord. And, and, and I liken it to having a, like, like having a, a doctor's appointment. You know, I don't know about you. But where I live, if you just don't show up to a doctor's appointment, they charge you something anyway. There's a there's a, a no show fee, <laughs> and yes, uh, in Seattle, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty <laughs> weird out here anyway. Um, but but my dentist does the same thing. You just don't not show up for an appointment. So God has made these appointments with His people, and it's this, you're right. It's called the Lord's appointed times. It's not just for Jewish people, even though we gave them first to the Jewish people, it's for everybody. And there's really something that, you know, as you and I know, there's a, a movement around the world today where people are beginning to see meaning and purpose and significance in understanding the Jewish roots of their faith. Yeah, Christians around the world are becoming more and more friendly toward the Jewish people and uh, more and more understanding of the biblical Jewish roots of their faith. That's probably a whole nother broadcast. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna dig into uh, Passover shortly, but first we have a few questions from, our, uh, from folks out there. And so we wanna answer uh, these, we got four questions here. And isn't it interesting that on Passover, the, the one of the children at the Passover Seder, which is a celebration of Passover, asked four questions. But we'll get to that a little later. Here's the first question, Highland. Uh, let's, let's see what we can do here. Somebody told me that Jesus did not go to church. Is this true? <laughs> That's a great question. Well, um, let me say a few thoughts and then you can add your your thoughts. By the way, one thing I really enjoy is uh, is you and I playing off of each other. That's been really so, sort of the highlight for me personally. And I have friends who've told me the same thing. They like the way that we play off of each other. So let me add some some, some thoughts to that. First of all, for, first of all, <laughs> um, there was no church in in Jesus's day, Yeshua's day. Um, these were Jewish men and women, Jew and children, Jewish believers in Messiah, who pretty much went from house to house. They broke bread from house to house. We see in the book of Acts, it gives us sort of a picture of the Acts of the Apostles, the, how the people related one to another and what they did. There was no central building until the fourth century when Constantine became a Christian, and actually that's up for debate whether he actually became 
whether he was a really a believer or whether he just sort of did this because it was a political move, but that's another discussion. But uh, in the fourth century, uh, Constantine uh, built a, a big building where, and he actually modeled it after his throne room in Rome, where he had, where the clergy would sit on the stage in big chairs and there was a, they were elevated uh, above what became known as the, uh, the laity. They had the clergy and the laity split. So the clergy was elevated because they were the important ones and the laity, the lay people were down below, uh, the common folk. And, and they started meeting in, in a building that they called the sanctuary. And, um, but before that, there was no church. So yeah, you gave some interesting history. So the fact of the matter is that uh, Jesus was not a good Christian boy that went to church every Sunday. He was actually a good Jewish boy, if you'll allow me such language, who went to synagogue on every Saturday Shabbat. And I just wanna share a scripture with you so that you know that uh, we are basing our thoughts not just because we're Jewish or we have some uh, ideas about things. It's because the scriptures are very clear and plain about this. And sometimes people even ask, well, why is it important? And I say it's important simply because it's the truth. You know, we want the truth because the truth in every area of life really sets us free. We want the facts, the historical facts and the truth, and it was part of God's plan. So here's the scripture I want to share with our audience that I think will be helpful to everybody. It comes from the Gospel of Luke. It's chapter four, and I'm reading uh, from verse 14 and on. Chapter four of Luke, verse 14 and on. Here we go. And it says, Yeshua, or Jesus, returned to the Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. See, he was living in the land of Israel, and he was teaching in the synagogues and in the temple and really everywhere. <laughs> And he went to Nazareth, verse 16, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. That's right. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handing, handed to him. So he stood up to read the traditional reading of that day in the synagogue. And it was about the spirit of the Lord being upon him. And uh, he said, you know what? Isaiah was talking about me. It's fulfilled right here in your hearing. So Yeshua, Jesus, was a, uh, a Jewish man. He was God in the flesh, but as a man, he was Jewish. And uh, he attended synagogue regularly on the Shabbat, as did the Apostle Paul, who sometimes people think he converted to Christianity and he... Uh, he didn't go to the synagogue, but it also says right here uh, in Acts 17. So I just want to hit, hit this also as well, because people also get confused about this. They think Paul became a Christian. He was actually a very devoted Jew who brought the gospel of the Jewish Messiah, who's the savior of the world, to the Gentiles, the people of the nations. But in Acts 17, in verse 2, it says this. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scripture, explaining and proving that Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a great question, and it's good that uh, we get clarity here on these kinds of things. We got another one here, Highland. Uh, it's kind of related. Uh, I have heard that Jesus was a rabbi. Is that true? <laughs> well, I would say, yes, he was a rabbi. Um, how do we know that? Because his disciples called him rabbi. And what, what is a rabbi? Uh, 
Rabbi is, is a teacher. In fact, Rav is teacher. Ravi, Rabbi is my teacher. So they would call him my teacher. I think in the Aramaic, it was Raboni, uh, my teacher. He was a rabbi, he was a teacher. He was the teacher, capital T. He was the rabbi, capital R. And uh, he taught quite a bit. And, and we think of rabbis today, not just teachers, but more like shepherds. And if we were to apply that uh, definition to Yeshua, to Jesus, then we would say, well, he was the shepherd. He was the great shepherd, you know, and he, he shepherded the flock and those who were under his care. Yes. Well, thank you for that question. I want to give you uh, one Bible verse there. It's one of many, but I want to give you one that you can focus on because it really gives clarity about the identity of Jesus, of Yeshua. And this comes from the Gospel of Yochanan, John, uh, Yochanan in Hebrew, and it's chapter 1, verse 49, chapter 1, verse 49 of the Gospel of John. And so Nathaniel is relating to Yeshua, and Nathaniel was another Jewish young man who became a follower of Yeshua, and he declared, verse 49, chapter 1, Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And uh, he said it all in that brief little statement, and Yeshua didn't say to him, Nathaniel, no, don't call me rabbi. I'm now a, a Christian pastor, a Catholic priest, or whatever. No, he didn't. He received the <laughs> title as he did in many other places in Scripture. And then he also received the title Son of God, which he is, God in the flesh, Son of God. And he also received the title King of Israel because that's who he is. So he was a rabbi, a teacher. He was also a prophet, but he was more than a rabbi, more than a prophet. He was the son of God, God in the flesh, and he is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king of Israel, the king of kings. Yeah, I think we just stop right there. That's excellent. <laughs> But yeah, think... it says it all right there. Nathaniel said it for all of us, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. he did. So... You know, there is, a, a, there is another, I mean, so, some of our listeners who know scripture, they may be asking, well, didn't Yeshua say, call no man rabbi? And, and he did say that. But what he was saying was that there were the, the Pharisees were, uh, were desiring positions of authority and stature in in the sight of man. They wanted people to call them rabbi. Um, they want, wanted to be recognized by men. And he also said, call no man father. But that's not exactly what he meant, because I call my father father, right? Uh, he was saying, you don't, don't elevate these, uh, these men to these high and lofty positions by giving them these titles that are really they didn't deserve. Yeah, um, that's, that's very important because it was really a manifestation of human pride on one side when the rabbis would receive this exaltation. Uh, and on the other side, it was a little bit like uh, almost when we put man above God, mm -hmm. even in the Talmud, there's a place where it says, even if we hear a voice from heaven, we're not gonna disregard the uh, uh, opinions of the rabbis. So, you know, this is a huge mistake. C Yeshua criticized the, uh, the ancestors of the modern day rabbis, uh, the Pharisees oftentimes, mm -hmm. although we also have to point out that it is an unfortunate uh, and sad reality that uh, so many in the Christian church have equated Pharisee with hypocrite. Uh, that is not a good thing to do. It's not an accurate portrayal. There were Pharisees that are hypocrites, just like there are some pastors that are hypocrites. Right. There are some priests that are hypocrites, but not all Pharisees were hypocrites. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Nicodemus and Joseph, they were not hypocrites. They were uh, sincere, good men, and there were many others. And Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees, and uh, 
he, you know, it's just an unfortunate, uh, really anti-Semitic theology that has crept in and really should kind of be pushed out already. I mean, we know better and uh, uh, people should uh, divorce themselves from calling Pharisees uh, hypocrites. I knew a very honorable rabbi who I uh, had many discussions with. He was a very sincere, honest uh, man, a servant-hearted man. He was he was he exemplified many many good godly characteristics that Yeshua would uh, commend, and he was in no way a hypocrite. So, so that that's that one. Then we got to get to this one here. Uh, um, did Jesus start a new religion? And then a follow-up question that went along with that, or was it the Apostle Paul that started the new religion? And so in these questions, there's an assumption that either Jesus or Paul started a new religion. And uh, is that the biblical and historical fact? We need to figure it out. Let's see what we can do here. Ah, uh, boy. That's a good question. I know a, a lot of people have had that question, and you and I have probably been asked this question before. Um, but when Yeshua came, uh, he came to fulfill the scriptures. The only scriptures they had were the Hebrew scriptures. We call it the Tanakh, which is the Torah, uh, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim, which is the, the, the five books of Moses, the uh, prophets and the writings. And uh, that's the whole Old Testament, basically. And so he came to fulfill the scriptures. And in fact, that scripture that you read, uh, you started to read in um, Luke chapter four, he read that passage from Isaiah 53. And then he, uh, was it 53? No, Isaiah 60, I think. And then he put so down the scroll um, and he said, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So he was living out, in fact, what I like to tell people in Hebrew is, Masha Yeshua Amar, Masha Hanavim Amru Yeshua Chai. What the prophets said, Yeshua lived. So he was living out the scriptures, and it was the Hebrew scriptures. He wasn't starting anything new, but he was fulfilling. In fact, in Matthew chapter 5, he said that. Uh, he didn't come to abolish the Torah and the prophets, but that they might be fulfilled in him. So they're not abolished. They're still alive and active and real for us today, but there's been a fulfillment because Messiah has come. So he didn't start any, he didn't start a new religion, but he did bring new life and new meaning and purpose to you may have called what we may call an, an old religion that had been around for a couple thousand years. Yeah, that verse, by the way, is Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, where he said, do not think, Yeshua said, I have come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill them, meaning not to fulfill them and reject them, but to fill them to the full, to Amen. overflowing. And, uh, you know, um, I know that uh, Francis and Edith Schaefer were a big influence in your life and Rita's life. She wrote a book. I forget the exact title, but the idea was... I can tell you. Give it to Christ me. Christianity is Jewish. Yes. And the idea is, and this is an idea that is fully supported in scripture. If we had time, I'd give you a bunch of passages of scripture on this, but biblical Judaism, forget about historical Judaism, and biblical Christianity, and the biblical Judaism and biblical Christianity in its purest sense is the exact same thing, because Jesus is the one who came to restore the Jewish people to the God of Israel, the God of creation, and through the Jewish people who were called to be a light to the world, to restore the people of the nations so that they would get free from worshiping idols and false gods and worship the God of Israel. Mm. And this is really what the whole book of Acts is all about. 
I'm going to be coming out with an ebook called the Jew a Jewish tour of the book of Acts. We're going to let you know about that. You're going to want to get a hold of it because you'll be able to dig in uh, much more deeply into that. And uh, you're going to get answers to a lot of questions. And in truth, the Old Testament or the Tanakh and the New Testament or the Brit Hadashah, it's a continuity, continuity of God's plan for mankind, the Jewish people and all people, and biblical Judaism in its purest sense and biblical Christianity in its purest sense are one of the same. So did the Apostle Paul start a new religion? Didn't he change his name? We talked about that uh, to start a new religion. Let's get an answer to that one. Well, let me just add something to that. This is the same question basically about the new religion, but in Ephesians chapter two, and I got my Bible open here at Ephesians chapter two, uh, we have this famous section where the apostle Shaul or Paul is talking about being Jews and Gentiles coming together as one new man. And I just want to say that the, the context is that the Gentiles are joining the Jews. You know, when I first came to the Lord, um, I was a Jewish boy and, and I went to a church. And That's where I heard the gospel Jewish for the boy, first right? time. Right. You, yeah. So, um, but in, in the, in the original context, in the first century believers, before before there was even a church, before they were even called Christians, they weren't called believers in Messiah until Antioch, which was, I don't know, 100 years later. Um, chapter 11. The, what's that? It's chapter 11 of the book of Acts. Yeah, so in Ephesians 2, Paul basically says that the Gentiles become citizens of Israel, the commonwealth of Israel. So the, the Gentiles are joining something that God began with Abraham. When people ask me, when did the church begin? I don't say Acts chapter 2. I say Genesis chapter 12, when God called Abram and he said, I'm, I will bless those who bless you. He who curses you, I will curse. And through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Through you, Abraham, and your seed, through Messiah, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed, aside from the, the physical nation, Israel, and Jewish people who have blessed the world. Ultimately, it was going to be through the Messiah and his death, burial, and resurrection, he's going to bless the whole world. So the whole thing is that these Gentiles are coming into a Jewish thing that God created a long time ago. Exactly. And we want to be clear and we'll, we will restate this over and over again. We do not believe that Jewish people are better than everyone else, nor do we believe that Jewish people are worse than everyone else. We right. understand from the scriptures that we are all sinners and that we need to be saved by the grace of God through faith in the shed blood of the Passover lamb, Yeshua, saved by the grace of God, through faith in the shed blood of the lamb and his resurrection. And that's how we have forgiveness of sins mm. and God dwells with us and in us. And we have the promise of eternal life. Amen. Yeah. And I want to just uh, summarize that important point that you made with one passage of scripture from Ephesians chapter three, verse six, because it says it succinctly and you folks can write it down or remember it because you can support these beliefs with the word of God. It's Ephesians 3, verse 6. The mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and shares together in the promise of Christ Jesus or Messiah Yeshua. Hmm. So just together as... Together with Israel. Yeah, just as Rabbi Highland said... The Jews who believe and then the Gentiles believe, we become together a one new man, but the Gentiles join. Also, we can use the analogy of the olive tree, wild mm. olive branches, Romans 11, joining with the natural branches who believe in Yeshua, and we become the olive tree or the body of Messiah together, Jews and Gentiles who are born again who are followers of Yeshua, very important, so that we get that right. I guess we need to move into that next question and give folks a little bit more 
uh, insight into Passover. This last question uh, will lead us into a good discussion on Passover. Did Jesus celebrate Passover? Oh my goodness. Give us How can anybody ask that the question? Rab the, the Jewish man, Jesus, Yeshua, the rabbi, the prophet, the son of God, God in the flesh, king of Israel, did he celebrate Passover? Okay, so yeah, how much time do we have? Um, so like you mentioned earlier, when we began talking about Leviticus 23, the appointed times of the Lord. Passover was one of those appointed times. And God said to do this, do Passover perpetually, uh, permanently, eternally, celebrate Passover. Did Yeshua celebrate Passover? Definitely. I think he celebrated every year of his life, just like you and I have. Um, and uh, the Last Supper, which is, you know, where he revealed his death, burial, and resurrection, uh, he that, that was a last Seder, Passover Seder, a Passover meal. And uh, the, the Gospels describe it perfectly well. Um, he definitely celebrated Passover. And he even said, he said, I earnestly desire to eat this Passover with you. When he sent his disciples to go find that upper room, he said, I earnestly desire to eat this Passover with you. And uh, in, in, in the Greek, it's more emphatic. It's more like, um, um, I desire to desire. <laughs> it's, it's an emphatic. It's like saying truly, truly, I desire to desire to eat this Passover with you. So he definitely celebrated Passover and uh, he was the Passover lamb. Yes, he, he is the ultimate Passover lamb that gives us that forgiveness that we've talked about so often, that redemption that Passover freedom from the bondage of sin and death. Only Yeshua had the authority and power to bring that about in your life and mine. And if you've never received that blessing of blessings, the ultimate, Yeshua is calling your name. He's knocking on the door of your heart and he's saying, open up and I will demonstrate to you that my love is real, my resurrection is real. I am the Passover lamb who gave my life for you because I love you. So to my Jewish and Gentile friends, open your hearts if you haven't yet. It'll be the best decision that you've ever made. But just to give everybody a little passage of scripture where Yeshua said that, I want them to be able to uh, dig this out of the Bible. This is Luke chapter 22, and it's verse 15. And uh, this is what Yeshua said. I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And many people may not know, but what the uh, Christian world calls the Lord's Supper or communion was initiated, began uh, at that Passover celebration when Yeshua identified himself with both the unleavened bread, the matzah, and the one of the cups of wine we drink four uh, small cups of wine during Passover. We don't get drunk. And uh, um, and I want to grab. I want to. So the Lord's Supper and Communion originated a Passover. That's why uh, I welcome. Uh, uh, Buddhist friends, Hindu friends, Muslim friends, Christian friends to join with us Jewish people and celebrate the Passover. It is so rich. And Rabbi Highland, I'm going to get up here. I want to grab a matzah and uh, I want you to talk about the amazing symbolism of that, but talk about something else about Passover. I'll just be a few seconds here. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so in, in Luke 22, uh, in that same chapter that Rabbi Stewart just read from, Yeshua, we drink, as he said, we drink four cups of wine or fruit of the vine, a Passover Seder. The third cup is called the cup of redemption. Yeshua holds up the cup of redemption and he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And when he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Now what the, the many Christians have done, what the historical church has done, is they made the emphasis on the word new. This cup is the 
new covenant, meaning it's something brand new. You, you've never heard of this before. Yeshua is initiating this thing right now, and it it's brand new. Well, when he said new covenant, it's in Hebrew, it's Berit Chadasha. There's only one place in the entire Bible they had at the time, the Hebrew Bible, where it says new covenant, only one place in Jeremiah 31, 31. Mm -hmm. And that covenant, if I if I can sit just quickly, Jeremiah, the Lord is speaking through Jeremiah. He said, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the one they broke, the one they gave to their forefathers when they were coming out of Egypt, but this covenant, I'm going to write my my uh, Torah in their hearts. I'm, I'm going to place my word within them. They're going to know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their iniquity and there's, and I will forget their sin. Their sin I will remember no more. I like to be a little more emphatic. I will forget their sin. So and 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 so the the Jewish people knew about the the previous covenants God made with Abraham. The sign of the covenant was circumcision. The uh, a covenant God made with Noah would, wouldn't destroy uh, the earth by flood again. The, the sign of the covenant was a rainbow. The God uh, made a covenant with Moses, uh, with, which was the Torah, the Ten Commandments, and. Uh, the sign of the covenant was the Sabbath day, but what was this new covenant? It was a mystery until Yeshua came and he said, this is the new covenant. And the sign of the covenant is my blood. Yeah, that is so awesome. And doesn't that go perfectly uh, with Ephesians 3, 6, where it says that the Gentiles joined together with the people of Israel who believe in Messiah Yeshua, and this is a mystery that unfortunately it was it was fortunately revealed 2000 years ago but still a mystery to many today jeremiah 31 this new covenant was made with the people of israel the jewish people the house of israel and then the gentiles might say well where do we come in well isaiah covered you in 49 6 he said speaking of messiah yeshua prophesied, is it too small a thing to bring back, to redeem the descendants of Jacob, the people of Israel, the Jewish people? I will make you a light to the nations. So this is why the, the good news and the power of salvation available only through the name of Jesus, Yeshua, has gone to the four corners of the earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's amazing. It's beautiful. It's powerful. It causes me to rejoice. And uh, I hope it does you as well out there. I know it does Rabbi Highland. Rabbi Highland, this is unleavened bread, matzah, that we eat during Passover. Just take a few minutes before we close down to explain the great symbolism here as Jewish people year after year uh, break the middle matzah. Explain that to us and the amazing symbolism we see here. Okay, you're giving me some good stuff to talk about here. I know that you can talk about them as well, but I appreciate you giving me the opportunity. So uh, on the Passover table is a, is a bag. We call it a matzah tash. Tash is a Yiddish word for purse or bag. In this matzah tash, there's three compartments where you put three pieces of matzah, just like Rabbi Stewart's holding up. And then, in the beginning of the Seder, we take the middle piece of matzah, we take it out and we break it. We put half of it back in and then we wrap half of it in a linen cloth and then we hide it away and we bring it back later at the end of the Seder when we're going to eat the bread and, the, and drink the wine together. Okay, so the Jewish people have had different traditions for these three pieces of matzah in this matzah tash. One of them is that it's, it, it symbolizes Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Another is that it symbolizes the priests, the Levites, and the Israelites. And as a kid growing up, we never questioned that. We okay, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the priests, the Levites, the Israelites. But when, when I got older, I started thinking, well, why would we take um, Isaac out of this bag and break him in half and wrap him up and hide him away? I mean, or, or why, why would we take the Levites, which is a whole tribe of... <laughs> Of, of Jewish 
people who served in the temple and wrap up the tribe of Levi and hide, put them away and bring them back at some point. But what if, just what if, the three compartments stand for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And we take that middle matzah and we break it in half and we wrap it up in a cloth, we hide it away, and later in, in the Passover Seder, Yeshua takes that matzah. He says, this is my body broken for you. Now, does that make sense now? Body was broken. Yeshua was wrapped in grave cloths. He was crucified. Body was broken, wrapped in grave cloths. He was in the grave three days and three nights. He came back later. That's what afikoman means, that which comes back later, or the dessert. It's actually not even Hebrew. It's a Greek word. And, and so we unwrap. We take off the grave cloth, so we partake of the matzah, and we take partake of this third cup, the cup of redemption, which Yeshua said, this is the new covenant in my blood. And um, one last thing, and I'll let Rabbi add something, because I know you're, you're dying to add something to this. In ah. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the Jewish apostle Shaul, or Paul, he says, let us celebrate the Feast of Passover, not with the old leaven, of malice and wickedness, but with the new leaven of sincerity and truth. And that's what that's what Passover is all about. Putting, and we talked about this last week in preparing for Passover, getting rid of the chametz, getting rid of the sin in our lives, coming to God with a fresh slate, saying, God, here I am, use me, fill me, um, I wanna be yours. And so we, we, we partake of this bread, and of this cup as a sign that we've come into the kingdom of God and we're, we want God to move in our lives and to refresh us, especially now at this Passover season. Amen. I'll just add, notice that the matzah is unleavened. Yeshua was the sinless lamb of God, the sinless sacrifice for you and me and all of us. Notice that it's bruised. He was bruised mm -hmm. for our iniquities. Notice that it's pierced. There's little piercings in him. And you know, he was pierced uh, when he was uh, on the cross mm. and, uh, suffering. And by his stripes, we are healed. And mm. so it's That's an amazing good. symbolism. Some think that uh, maybe this was initiated by Messianic Jews who had great favor amongst the uh, greater Jewish community. Some people don't realize that, uh, that the Messianic Jews of 2,000 years ago after the resurrection of Yeshua, they had great favor and they were held in high esteem amongst uh, a great many of the Jewish people in Jerusalem and Judea and beyond. And you can see that in Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 47. Uh, and it's very possible that the Messianic Jews initiated this and uh, they were pointing to the Father, the Son, Yeshua, and the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Mm. So, uh, Good stuff. We could go on and on. I love this topic, and uh, I trust that this has been helpful, interesting, inspiring, and uh, helped you to get the biblical, historical facts correct about some of these things that we've discussed today. Next week is a very special time in Israel. It is called Yom HaShoah. Shoah is the Holocaust or the disaster of the Holocaust. And so we're going to be speaking about Yom HaShoah, Israel's Holocaust Remembrance Day. Mm -hmm. And then two weeks from today, we're going to be talking about Yom HaAtzma'ut, which is Israel Independence Day. And I'm looking forward to revisiting that topic as well. If you miss any of these episodes, you can find the recorded episodes on Beit Tikva Messianic Congregation Facebook site or the Reach Initiative International Facebook site or the Reach Initiative International website, reachii.org. And you can listen to them or watch them at your convenience. We have them all there. And uh, we hope, again, that uh, you will spread the word to others that uh, uh, will benefit from hearing these kinds of discussions. So thank you for sharing your time with us. And let's just end with a word of prayer. Good. 
Avinu Malkenu, our great father, our great king, the lover of our souls, yet you are high and lifted up, holy and separated from the brokenness and sinfulness of mankind. You are pure, you are just, you are truth, you are loving and you are merciful and we are so grateful that you have redeemed us and this redemption is available to Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor, every person on this earth, Lord God, equally. This grace, this redemption that you have provided through the great and ultimate Passover lamb, Messiah Yeshua, who gave his life, shed his blood, and then rose from the dead because sin could not hold him, because he was unleavened, meaning no sin was found in him. Lord, we are so grateful that you set the Jewish people mm. free from physical slavery 2000, uh, 3,500 years ago, and that you set everyone who would receive this grace gift from you, set us free from spiritual bondage and death mm -hmm. because of Yeshua. Thank you so much. Thank you for the amazing love, mercy, and grace you pour into our lives. And thank you for everyone who has joined us on this episode. We pray Passover joy, freedom, and power into their lives and a growing and intimate relationship with the lover of their souls, mm. Messiah Yeshua. Thank you. Amen. And mm. amen. Great prayer. Hallelujah. I'm looking forward to next week, 5 p.m. Eastern, uh, 2 p.m. Pacific, next Wednesday, talking about Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day. Have a blessed week, everyone. God bless you. Shalom. Shalom.